Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And a topical matter that is in the news at this point is the whole um, topic of Haitians in the Dominican Republic. And it was reported sometimes last week that President Abinader, that's the president of the Dominican Republic, has said at the United Nations that he is prepared to deport 10,000 Haitians weekly from his country. For those of you who do not know, the Dominican Republic shares island with Haiti. The entire island is known as the island of Hispaniola, right? So you can go on Google and look at Hispaniola, read a little about the history, because I do recommend that people begin to reassess and to reread their history, because a lot of the actors behind what is happening are the descendants of these people who controlled the transatlantic African slave trade. So we know that there are remnants of what happened. And when we say that we were free, were we really free? Did Africans and African peoples in the diaspora, in the diaspora, you know, in, in, the, in the Americas, I should say, were they really free from slavery? Yes, from shackles, from the shackles around our hands. But a lot of the issues are still at play. A lot of the revolutionary and the counter-revolutionary rhetoric, right, it continues to remain with us. And we've got to look and delve into these very complex matters. I don't want to get into the very simplistic understanding also of history that many people have. Some people have this leftist understanding of history. Some of you have this right-wing understanding of history, which that's not history, right? That is a narrative. History has to be studied in its entirety, right? We cannot begin to, um, you know, talk about and to tether ourselves to one particular specific narrative. And there are those of you who are talking about, wow, he's anti-Haitian or the person who might be pro-Haitian. Be careful of the person who says that he's pro-Haitian and anti-Haitian, because a lot of the people who claim that they're pro-Haitians are people who are not helping. In fact, they're compounding the problem, as we're seeing with the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party talks a lot about racial um, cohesion, right, and that they are about social and racial justice. But what they, the plight of the Haitians right now is being compounded by the Democratic Party in the United States under the President Joseph Biden's administration. And we have to understand that President Trump is not in office right now. And a lot of the wars and the tension that we're seeing between Washington and Port-au-Prince is happening under the Democratic administration. So I just want to clear that up and let you understand that you have to move away from this Democratic, Republican, or right-wing versus left-wing narrative that we have been, you know, um, talking about and people have been so passionate to defend to the talking points of their political parties because we're living in a world that is so political at this moment that people cannot reason intelligently and rationally anymore. It's almost like we are programmed to speaking um, the political talking points of the parties that we have tethered ourselves to. Remove your mind. I'm not suggesting that you cannot vote for a particular party, but you must also be willing to have a critical analysis uh, or to do a critical analysis of the party to which you might attach yourselves, right? Always do that because it is not what you think and the matters that surround, for example, this Haitian deportation is not as simplistic as you think it is, right? Because many people will say now that the present uh, party under Louis Abinader, which is the president of the Dominican Republic, is a right-wing party. But the fact of the matter is that aren't we all right-wing in terms of whether you're in the in the DR or in the United States? Most parties in the world right now are, are right-wing parties, right? Most of what we hear coming out of the left-wing narrative is social justice and racial harmony. And they do things a lot that, you know, it's not what people say often, is what they do. But let's look at the news coming from the, um, let's look first at CNN. Now, so we have CNN websites here says, uh, Dominican Republic to report up to 10,000 Haitians a week, citing an excess of immigrants. So they're saying that there is an excess of immigrants 
in the Dominican Republic coming from Haiti. Now, you'd understand that Haiti is in a mess at this point in time, right? You have a lot of gangs, and it doesn't seem like the people, the security forces are able to control the gangs in Haiti. Now, understanding is that Port-au-Prince, which is the capital of Haiti, is 80% controlled by gangs, right? So the gangs control 80% of the city. So can you imagine the horror that the people are actually going through? And we need to understand that these are human beings like yourself. So if they're constantly in fear, you know, um, for the safety of their lives, it is something that is unthinkable, unimaginable, and something that is a disaster, right? This is a catastrophe that we have to show some amount of um, sympathy towards, compassion, and all of that. Right. And these are people who are proud people and people who have been revolutionary in history. Right. Um, the Haitians are known for their revolutionary mindset. If you remember about the Haitian Revolution and no other book, no other person is able to write about that revolution like CLR James. Right. Who talked about revolution in such glowing manner. And he also was able to connect right, the, 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 the realities of that revolution and connect it to our modern day realities, at least some of them, right, some of our modern day political and economic realities. And, you know, if C.L.R. James were alive, I'm really wondering what he would think of all of what is happening now, especially as it regards to U.S. imperialism, because when C.L.R., I think C.L.R. James died in 1989, so when he died, at that on that year and when he died uh, in 1989 that was a time that the wall the burning wall you know came down and we had the end of what you call let us say the first phase of the cold war right because the cold war has been an ongoing matter when you think about the neocons and when they actually was writing that document penning the documents uh, immediately after the fall of the berlin wall the neocons in washington were already penning a document called the New America, the New American Century, the project for the New American Century, which I read, you know, some years ago after 9-11, um, in which the United States actually plotted what it would do to cement its um, quest for full spectrum dominance, to cement that place in the world that it is a, an empire that is unrivaled in the entire human history. Now, so that is something, and Haiti and all of these countries, what you're seeing, the is playing out there is because the United States seeks to control strategic locations. And Haiti has strategic points from, you know, ever since the revolution, you know, the United States has always had aspect or places in Haiti that it considers to be of prime or strategic location in order to wage its imperial wars, you know, in the continent. So we have to understand these things. Don't just think about Haiti as just some poor country and these people, why the United States would want to go there, right? There are more things at play that meets your eyes. And that's why you have to read history. You've got to get yourself and get yourselves a copy of C.R. James the, about the, um, the revolution. Right, the Black Jacobins, right? That is the title of the book by C. L. R. James. Go and read the book, right? And you'll see it very clearly. And there are lots of other books that are have been written about the Haitian Revolution, but that is the classic work on the Haitian Revolution that you need to read about and you need to expose yourselves to and stop just listening to what you hear coming from the media and what you hear coming from your political parties to which you are affiliated. Because a lot of times you're just saying half truths, propaganda right, deceptions, and you love it. I know that many of you are not willing to read because you prefer to go and dine and, you know, party and watch the games, what is happening on football and the soccer matches. And, you know, and these things are just there for your entertainment. But this is what they're saying that the government plans to expel 10,000 Haitians per week. Government spokesman, uh, that's Omero Figueroa, told reporters that the government took the decision after noticing an excess of Haitian migrants in the Dominican Republic, which shares the island of Hispaniola with Haiti. Figueroa said officials have seen an increase in Haitian migrants as a UN-backed mission in Haiti to uh, fight gang violence flounders. So he's suggesting here that the UN-backed mission is not working. 
right? It's not working. It is a failure. And recently they have sent Jamaican soldiers, you know, Jamaican security forces into Haiti to do what I don't know because Jamaica also has problems with gangs, right? And I'm not sure what we're doing there. And that alone should send a message to the world, if not only Jamaicans, but to the world that this is a farce, that this is farcical, right? It is nothing that is real. This is just window dressing um, to sort of pretend as if the United States wishes to bring law and order back to Haiti. It wishes to restore its democracy, right? That sacred word that the United States likes to use and say that it is for, you know, spreading democracy, it's diffusing democracy around the world, freedom and democracy, right? And because the U.S. is the only country that knows or is acquainted with that word, right? No other country knows about freedom like the United States of America. And it so wishes to spread that, you know, of political ideology around the world. But, you know, when the United States says democracy, it's really talking about militarism and imperialism, right? Let me repeat that. When the United States utters the word democracy, what it really means is imperialism and militarism. These are Siamese twins, something that you have to understand. And I'm preaching this for a long time. You've got to get it in your cranium because if it is Haiti today, it's going to be you tomorrow. It's going to be New York City tomorrow. It's going to be Pennsylvania tomorrow. It is going to get there, right? Because the military industrial complex respects not even its own citizens, right? It will kill if it has to kill. If its own citizens pose a challenge to that, that complex, to the military industrial complex, they are going to kill anything in the way, whether you're black, white, yellow, or purple, right? It will kill. Because this is what imperialism and militarism is all about. Something that you've got to dig deeper into. Something that is a, a little bit, and I shouldn't say it's a little bit, it's depressing. It's depressing stuff when you get yourself immersed into that sort of study. Right? And you try to make your connections to see what is happening in the economic and the political and the religious realm. Right. Don't forget also that there are religious undertones and, you know, um, to what we're seeing happening um, as far as the United States military industrial complex is concerned. Now, last year, the Dominican Republic, that is coming from Sydney, deported more than 174,000 people, it says, are Haitians. And in the first half of the year, it has expelled at least 67,000 more. Right. So the Dominican Republic is serious. But why are they sending these people away? Why are they deporting them? Because what they're suggesting, and they have some valid reasons for doing that, is that the country cannot, you know, take on all the weight of the Haitian problem. Right? They cannot assume every, all of the burdens of what is happening in Haiti. Because what is happening in Haiti could have been averted. It's a, small, it's a small island in comparison to, you know, um, an, island, an island like, you know, Cuba. So the United States could, at this juncture, bring about, if it were serious, some amount of order, law and order in that country if it wanted to. But we know that, you know, it, it, it is order out of chaos, right? Is it ab cow, right? That's, I think, the French word is order out of chaos. And the United States is creating that chaos. So out of that chaos, it can get what it really wants. Because when you have chaos, people don't know where to move and they don't know what's happening, really. So they can confuse you, they can make up stories, some of them which will be valid, some are not valid, propaganda, and you believe it because you know you can't really you know, unwind, you can't unravel, I should say, what you are seeing around you. So now we're seeing a lot of confusion in Haiti. We don't know what the real stories are. Right? If they're caught, the truth is coming from CNN, of course, the truth is never coming from CNN, but we don't know. But we do know that the, the Dominican government did say at the United Nations that he is prepared. If the United Nations and the core countries, including the United States, do not act um, to solve this problem, this you know huge Haitian uh, migration to the Dominican Republic, that they will have to do it. Do I blame them? Well, they also have to have some amount of law and order in their country. Now, the Haitians are very interesting people. Very, it's an interesting culture to watch. And what I'm seeing in the DR 
and I'm looking, I'm on the grounds. So I'm able to see and observe, and I'm a keen observer, and I'm watching observing what's going on with this Haitian migrant. And there is an onslaught, particularly after the pandemic and after the slaughter of the former president, the prime minister, wasn't the president? President, right, um, Jovenel Moui, right? There have been a huge um, Haitian migration wave to the Dominican Republic. Now, what is interesting the, the, in the, the, the migration I'm now seeing of, you know, of the Haitians to the DR is a different sort of migration. First of all, many of them who are coming are working class migrants, as you would know. Haiti is a very poor country. Very few people there are wealthy. And it's almost like, a, you know, few probably middle class, but it's practically not a middle class country, right? It's the very rich and the very poor. But you have a few persons who are part of that middle class, right? It's not big, but it's minute. The fact of the matter is, what I, the difference I'm seeing now between the migration I saw before in previous times and now is that I'm seeing these working class people, these Haitian working class Haitians, coming to the DR with seeing that they have money. So I don't know. They seem to have money and they're living in neighborhoods that they would never live in before because the neighborhood, you know, the, the cost would have been hit prohibitive, right? But now what I'm seeing is that they are living in communities, in neighborhoods, where they are paying their rent. I, you don't know where they're getting the money from. And, you know, when they do come to these neighborhoods, they cook a lot, they dress nicely, right? And they, you know, remain in their rooms and sometimes with their doors opened. Weird, you know? And they just constantly cook. And you're really wondering, what are these people doing? Where are they getting their monies from? It's possible that the members of the Haitian diaspora could be supporting them and they can just sit and, you know, have fun and eat four meals a day, sometimes five meals a day. If you live close to Haitian, they cook a lot, right? And if you live close to them, you're going to have to be smelling those smells. Even sometimes at 12 midnight, they're cooking. They don't know what they're cooking, but, you know, they're cooking and the smell that comes, this very potent odor, you know, well, I shouldn't say odor, aroma, I should say, from the food that they're cooking. And you're wondering, where are these people getting the money from? But I would want to think that there might be some other organizations behind the scenes um, which are actually supporting economically these Haitians. But the problem is that the natives in the DR are wondering, how are these people able to live, some of them, better than they are living while they're coming, they're living in their own country? Now, we see the same thing happening in America. And people are so much obsessed with what Trump said in the debates with Kamala Harris about, you know, Haitians are pet eating um, dog, well, it was dog, the dogs, right? They're eating the dogs and they're eating the cats, which was something very stupid of Trump to say, right? Without any having any evidence to say that this is so, right? You know, you don't speak like that as a president or as a you know, potential um, president, someone who is vying for the position of presidency of the greatest country in the world, right? How do you speak like that, you know, without any proof? If he had evidence, of course, he could show them the evidence, but he had no evidence that Haitians are actually eating um, cats and they're eating the dogs. Now, Haitians do practice voodoo. I do not know, and I understand that some of these heathen practices, they do use some of these animals, in there. In fact, human beings, a lot of times, are used in some of these heathen practices. If you go to the, well, I, I've never been to the church of, of the devil, of, of Satan, but he has churches. Even in the United States, you have the church of, of, of Satan. And if you listen to people who have come out of these churches, and I've listened to many testimonies, and the testimonies tend to be consistent, that you have to shed blood when you are practicing these sort of, I say that, demonic activities. And, you know, and I want to respect people, um, but I do not think, I do not subscribe to any voodoo and obi and all of these things. I think that they are demonic. Obia is coming out of Jamaica, for example, and I think all of these activities are demonic, but they do involve some amount of sacrifice. The, the Jews practiced that when, you know, Christ, you know, the, the, the Bible, if you read the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah, these prophets were 
warning the Israelites about staying away from these heathen practices because they would not, they decided not to honor the, the, the God of heaven. So they were worshiping other gods and these gods required that they cut themselves and that they sacrificed their children, that they killed animals unnecessarily to shed blood, right? So it is possible that some Haitians, and I'm not saying all of them, Right, who subscribe to this Buddha practice might be involved and might kill some of these pets. But you know, one of the things that I find amazing is that people begin to act very hypocritical as oh, people are eating cats or dogs. Many people in the world eat pig, right? And the Bible describes the pig as just like on the same of the same kind as the rat. Would you eat a rat? Many people would say no, they would never eat a rat, but you eat pig, right? And the, in the Bible. It is in the same category, right? The pig is one of the nastiest meat. And I'm not saying it because I'm an Adventist, but if you should read about the pig, and those of you who have reared pigs at home and you see how nasty a pig is, right? How can you even eat that pig, right? Maybe it would be even <laughs> healthier, and I would never eat a cat, but maybe it would be a cat is cleaner <laughs> than eating a pig, you know? But the fact is, I would never, you know, I would not vouch for eating any of these animals. But what the whole discussion should be about, really, is U.S. imperialism toward Haiti, which has been suppressed by that simple, you know, pronouncement from Trump. So you really wonder if the military industrial complex had set Trump up to talk about that. And then you'd have the media now trying to debunk what he's saying without engaging in a critical understanding, in a critical discussion, in a critical conversation about US imperialism and militarism toward Haiti. Because that should be the discussion, not they're eating cats and the dogs. Because if 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 United States were not in Haiti, if they were not carrying out those imperialistic agendas in Haiti, then Possibly you would not have all these Haitians running over to the United States. And the people in these communities in Pennsylvania, in Springfield, Ohio, they are suggesting too that the Haitians come there and they come there with loads of money, lots of cash. And they're buying these fancy cars, these fancy vehicles, and they're roaming and driving around the place even though they can't drive well. And they're creating a lot of accidents in their communities, right? These are problems, these are issues that we cannot deny. And we must not deny them because we are not of a particular pers uh, political persuasion, right? We've got to, you know, come to grips with the reality that this is a problem, right? And Americans who are barely finding it, you know, barely meeting their, their monthly expenses, Right, they find that they see Haitians buying all these foods from the stores, and they can't afford to buy all of those food that the Haitians are buying. Right, um, you have this guy in Ohio, for example, who said that he had an apart. There was an apartment that was up for rent for fifteen hundred dollars per month, and he said that he was on you know the path to getting that that apartment, and then all of a sudden. He was eclipsed by these Haitians who came there. So obviously it could be that the Haitians had to pay more because they're coming in with this cash. They have this all of this amount of money that they're coming in with. And people are wondering, where are they getting the money from? I was listening also to a, and maybe I should try to pull it up. While I'm, you know, I'm talking, let me see if I can pull that up because it was something that I would like you to see. And it was a conversation uh, between two or three among, I should say, among three Bahamians who were talking about the Haitian crisis, the, the, the Haitian migration crisis in that country, in that Caribbean country. Let me see if I could pull that up. If I can't, yeah, I think it might be this. It's going to take some time for me to, yes. So let me, no, it's not this. Wow. Yeah, it's not this. But they were talking about the fact that the Haitians who are in the, in the, um, in the uh, in the Bahamas, well, who will be deported rather from Haiti from the Dominican Republic, they are going to be on their way to 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 the to the Bahamas, 
that was what they were essentially talking about. Let me see if I can find it, and because I, I'd like you, yeah, it's it's here, yeah, it's here. So let let me let me let me get the let me share my screen because this is important. This is something important that you watch. I I forgot when I was, you know, sometimes you have lots of things to say and you don't remember that you had this to say or this to show. Right, that's why it's important to do thorough preparation, right? Okay, so let me see if you can, yeah, you should be able to see it now. Let me see if I should, uh, oh, I have to take a, I have to. As of next week, 10,000 patients per week. And then they'll get the back pain. They should have done it before, and they've got to take the sovereignty of their nation. Seriously, they've got to take care of their people. Okay? Yes, you help people one at a time when you can, but you can't help drain the water thousands of people. That is the approach that we need to take. But for America, is that one? Nobody, the UN, or none of these other countries is going to say to the Dominican Republic, here is some funds to help you to prevent the course of you having the word. They don't do it to the Dominican Republic, they don't do it to us because we are small countries of color. You know, last year, they deported 170,000 people. So far this year, almost 100,000. Now they got to go 10,000. But where do you think most of them have? They can get the Bahamas and all that. Right. So you have you have oh let me see if I can put this. Yeah, so you have seen what that was all about, right? You have seen that that is what they were saying in terms of the Haitian problem. Now, it is not true that the governments and the private sector, uh, the economic elites, what I call the economic, you know, control, the members who control the economic um, stalwarts of our countries, they, I think, receive money funds from the United Nations or from multilateral organizations to do these things, but they receive them behind the scenes. What they do is that they allow these immigrants in, these illegal immigrants in, and then you and I are the ones who have to deal with them. They don't have to deal with them. They're not going to their neighborhoods. And then we begin to fight, and then, then they, our own government and the economic elites who are enriched by all of this chaos, right? Then they will tell you that you're a racist and that you are this and that you are, you know, ethnocentric, you are, you know, a, a bigot, you know, all of these things that they will say to you to shame. You. But they're the ones who are taking money. They're making huge amount of money out of this chaos, out of this Asian chaos. And that is what needs to be said. But let me also have you listen to um, something coming out of the United States from Sky News, right? Uh, so let me share my screen with you again so that you can listen to what they are saying. Let me take this out so you can listen carefully. Folks, the people that came in, they're eating the cats. It was an extraordinary claim. So what is really going on in Springfield, Ohio? I see a lot of cats that have disappeared. Really? On Facebook. What, what, what do you know? What have you seen? No, all our ducks are gone. What do you think about it? Have you, have you heard about it? I've heard about it, but I haven't seen anything really no. and you're not worried about your dog no but who's eating them i have no idea well, I don't but then a man who didn't want to be on camera with a hint of how these conspiracies are seated i've never seen nothing going on with the dog again except what i've seen on tiktok with the screen bro please yeah pressing the lady for eating a cat yeah that's that she was from she was from ohio you know, she, I think she's from a Haiti, wasn't she? Why'd you kill the cat? This is the video he's seen. Police footage of a woman being arrested for allegedly killing and eating a cat. Yes, but she isn't a Haitian migrant. She is American. She was born here. And this isn't Springfield either. 
Across this town, we have not found anyone who has seen pet-eating immigrants. The dogs seem safe. The cats are roaming loose. The instinct then may be to laugh at this Trumpian rhetoric. Indeed, the Haitians of Springfield can see the funny side too. Uh, <laughs> the Haitian dog eating the cat, the the dog. No, it's 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 it's, it's, it's no, it's not. It's not the culture to to eating that. But within this cat and dog story, there are some actual truths, because there are huge challenges here over immigration. This is your, your passport and your paperwork. Fitio is one of 15,000 who have arrived here in this town from war-torn Haiti since 2020. The pressures on services and society are understandable. You left your country, you know why you left your country, the working, uh, go to school, study. It's okay. Casey Rawlings runs the centre. How did you feel when you heard Donald Trump's words the other night? I was physically ill. I was physically ill. Still am. I can't even react. I mean, I can't even repeat it. It's just unfathomable to me. Um, but that's what happens when hysteria is spread, you know, and you know, all kinds of fictional uh, narratives. And it's it's really, really doing harm to our world. We looked at another view from another Springfield resident that has gone viral. Like we've been invaded by some sort of pest. I'm angry that my friends and family are packing up and moving away. I'm angry that foreigners are using up the resources that were set up for the Americans that reside here. Every community, every culture has its myth and its folklore. I guess we're hearing it. The tensions in the town are clear, but they are being fanned. This accident last year was caused by a Haitian driver. This 11-year-old died. Trump's running mate, J.D. Vance, said online he was murdered by migrants. Listen, though, to the boy's father. I wish that my son, Aiden Clark, was killed by a 60-year-old white man. I bet you never thought anyone would ever say something so blunt. But if that guy killed my 11-year-old son, the incessant group of hate-spewing people would leave us alone. And so there it is, the anatomy of a conspiracy about cats and dogs in a country where there are so many different truths. Mark Stone, Sky News, from Springfield, Ohio. Um, that's an interest. Let me see if I could get my base back. Yeah, so that was an interesting sort of analysis coming from Sky News. Now, it's interesting that Sky News is normally on the conservative end of the narrative, uh, but they seem to be also anti-Trump. Quite interesting. But the fact of the matter is that we need to assess what really is going on beyond what the media is saying. We have to listen to the good, the bad, and the indifferent, right? Because the stories are just not that it is, you know, this is happening or this is not happening. It's not as simplistic as the news would like to put it. You know, we, we, we need to talk about, you know, what is happening with the military industrial complex and its attitude, its relationship to Haiti for so many decades, you know, for so many years. That is, you know, the, the news media, they tend not to put that in, in proper context. Everything is just simplistic and it has to do with the Haitian migrants there and what they're doing and what they're not doing. We also have to look at culture, you know, a cultural, now we need cultural experts and we need to also be able to say things honestly and not because people think that these are taboos, that these things might not exist. Just like many people think that pedophilia doesn't exist or it's a taboo subject and people who might eat other animals that are forbidden. I remember coming out of Jamaica so many years, so, so, so some years ago, could be 2014, where, you know, some people in a community eating um, crocodile, not alligators, right, which in the Jamaican culture is a taboo to eat. Um, but it was real that some people were actually eating um, uh, alligators, you know, even though it is not a Jamaican sort of, of, of cuisine, right? But people, some people do eat it. 
<laughs> right? So we ought not to generalize to and say everybody might not, because some people might. You know, I've had conversations with even Dominicans who have told me that in some neighborhoods, right, in some of their neighborhoods, they people do eat. And I'm talking about from the low, the working class neighborhoods. They do eat dogs sometimes they eat cats too you know so the fact is that we should not want to stereotype people for eating a certain animal if they do eat the animal not that you and i perhaps share that as i told you many of you out there eat pigs you eat pork and that animal is one of the nastiest animals that you could put in your mouth no matter how much you cook it right but the fact of the matter is that that is how you have been acculturized and it is what you do Right. And, you know, we, we cannot because the majority of us eat something, it means therefore that it is right. And because the minority eats a certain food, it means that it is wrong. Or we begin to put up our pouch of our mouths. Oh, wow. How could they eat cats? How could they eat dogs? You know, and I'm not, of course, a proponent of eating dogs or cat or the pig. Right. But I'm just suggesting that we cannot also generalize that they are all of them are eating it. Some of them might. Some of them might not. Um, what if they sometimes use it in their religious practices? We've got to look at these issues in a more, much more open mind perspective. I think that a lot of the reporting tends to be very, very, um, you know, subjective and things that we want to hide. We try to suppress truth rather than looking at the rather go than going there with an open mind. Right and and assess the problem uh, from that perspective and try to render, you know, a, a transparent understanding of what is happening in these communities. But what I do see in the DR is that there are lots of Haitians coming, and the Haitians who are coming are Haitians who are particularly um, not willing to, you know, to to. Uh, what should I say now? They're, they're not willing to immerse themselves in the cultures that they're going into, they're, that they find themselves into. In fact, they're willing, more willing to impose their cultural norms and habits and mores on their adopted culture, on the culture that they're now going to. And the women tend to have a lot of children. So, you know, I sympathize with communities like in Springfield that have about their say that has 20,000, over 20,000 Haitians. That's a lot of Haitians to bring into one small community, right? And the women do have a lot of children. So that is going to be a problem. And if you are also giving these people, I don't know who is giving them, I can't say. So don't also accuse me of saying that I know. I don't know who is giving them money. But a lot of who I see, I see them as working class people. You can see it in their behavior. But the fact of the matter is that they're getting money, they're supported financially by some organization and they can come and they can sit in their rooms and they do a lot of cooking, right? And they just stay there watching TV, cooking and having fun. Now, who lives like that? And there are people in Ohio, in the same Springfield, who talk about, who testify that they're doing that, the same thing in, in, in Ohio, where they stay in their homes Homes have been remodeled, refurbished for them to stay in, and they drive nice cars, very expensive cars, cash. And they're also buying loads of food, lots of food. So sometimes Americans go to the supermarket and the supermarket have supermarkets have run out of food because of the Haitians con continuously buying loads of food to pack up and just to sit at home and have fun cooking and eating. And if I were not experiencing that, I would think that people are lying. But I'm seeing some of these same tendencies right here in Santo Domingo. So this is something that is interesting. And who is going to support, who are supporting the Haitians who are coming here? And it is going to create an ethnic war be, you know, between the two countries because if they're seeing that you know on the other hand well they are not living well the dominicans are not able to live many of them are not able to live well economically and they see that haitians are coming here and they're just living you know with ease i think that is going to
pose a major, it is going to create, it's going to, yeah, it's going to create a, a major war, which I think people have to think about. And perhaps that's the reason that Luis Abinader, the president of the Dominican Republic, you know, uh, has said that he might be left with no other option than to deport 10,000 Haitians per week. That's a lot of Haitians to be deported um, at a given time from one country. But what do you think? What do you think about this problem? It's a very complex problem. I don't want to hear any simplistic narrative about social justice and all of that stuff. Yes, we must be sympathetic, but we also have to have law and order, right? Because if we don't have law and order, we can't talk about social justice, right? We have to look at the problem from its root cause. Why, why are Haitians fleeing their country? And what is this historic relationship that the United States has with Haiti to have created, and the core group, I should say, to have created the sort of disaster, the sort of catastrophe that we're now witnessing there in the land of the South Global Shore. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like and you'll share and you'll subscribe. Remember now to leave an intelligent comment. And do you think, do you really think that the whole Haitian migration crisis, if it is not controlled, do you think it's tenable? Do you think that, you know, it will eventually create a lot of chaos um, in countries that they're fleeing to? I mean, I would like to hear your comments. And please also leave in the comment box things that you'd like me to talk about in the video. Thank you so much for joining. See you then. Adios. Hasta luego.